And they said, no, you're like 14, you just got your black belt, you need a lot of years of training. Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 476. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Coach Lena Khalifa. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for this show, founder of Whistlekick. And everything we're doing here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we're doing for the traditional arts, go to whistlekick.com. And that's where you'll find everything we've got going. One of the things that we've got going is our store. And if you make a purchase, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% and show some love to Martial Arts Radio. Our show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The goal of the show is to connect, educate, and entertain martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show beyond making a purchase, there are a number of ways you can do it. You can share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend. Pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review, or support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content, and if you contribute as little as $5 a month, you're going to get access to that content. You can contribute less. We value everything that our fans do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Using that word fan is a little bit odd for me, but people keep telling me I need to use that word, so I will reluctantly comply. My guest today has quite a story, a powerful story, in fact, one of adversity. We like to think that the traditional arts is full of nothing but kind, compassionate people who are mutually supportive and lift each other up to achieve their goals. The reality, unfortunately, is that that's not true. Today's guest took that adversity, overcame it, and now helps others do the same thing. It's a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Coach Khalifa, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, listeners, we were just talking about weather, comparing notes from Vermont to Toronto, and, and uh, we're, we're winning the cold war here. <laughs> it's always colder here. It's colder here than, than so many other places. I know. Yeah. But that's okay. Because I'm inside and it's warm and hopefully it's it's warm wherever you are right now. Yeah. I can't think when it's cold. I don't do well. I don't do well when it's cold. Give me at least a, a jacket and a hat. You know, I, I've, I see videos of people doing martial arts outside and I've done some of that. You know, I've, I've been at classes where they made me run through the snow. You did? But that's not my preference. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd rather be inside training, <laughs> especially if I'm barefoot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid to slip sometimes uh, on the ice. So I'm just very cautious when I'm outside, especially running. Yeah. yeah. Is running a big part of your training? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Cardio is a big part of the training. So I do run uh, three to four times a week. Um, okay. I try to maintain running because it uh, helps me in, you know, breathing <laughs> later on and uh, keeping my, right. yeah, my heart active. Right. What kind of distance are you running? Uh, I don't, I usually measure it by hour. So I usually run for an hour, but I noticed like, uh, how you notice sometimes, uh, improvement is sometimes you, you take pauses a lot while you're running, but like, sometimes I just run for a whole hour nonstop. So wow. it depends also on the energy, how you're feeling that day. Everything. An hour of running is, is a lot of running. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things. I don't know that, yeah. I don't know that I've ever run for an hour straight. Uh, usually if you think, if you have a lot of things to think about, it's good to run and think about all the mm. things. So it's kind of like meditation running. Yeah. I, I, I once, I once heard someone say that runners are always running from something. Yeah. Which I found <laughs> yeah. to be really interesting. And, yeah. And maybe we'll get into that later, but we don't have to get into it now. Of course, we're here to talk about martial arts. So let's start talking about martial arts and let's start with this. When did you start training? Training as an exercising martial arts or like just practicing or training other people? Practicing, right? When did you start yourself? Oh, okay. So I started at the age of five years old. I was enrolled in Taekwondo. That was the first martial arts that I, and I was, I was, um, I was addicted to it. You know, like it's an addiction. Martial arts can be kind of addiction. A lot of discipline, commitment. It just uh, defines my values and who I am. 
that was uh, as a kid i was going there i was going to the dojo three times a week um and uh, committing to my practices at least during summer not during a school time but later on i um, i realized that also the coach that you want to the master you want to follow has to be really inspiring and has to believe in you so I, I did change a couple of dojos until I found uh, the best master to teach me um, martial arts, Taekwondo. You were really that hooked that young? Yeah, because I, I was a big troublemaker. I used to fight oh. with the boys in the street. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was right, like, we're, we're getting somewhere. Yeah, I was like, my parents did not find any other sports. <laughs> um to just um they, they uh, i think at that time in in jordan i was raised in uh, jordan uh, the middle east and uh, taekwondo was really well known by among kids um we did not have other sports like basketball or we do have them but like usually during school times and it's just an activity with school but they don't take it seriously but taekwondo was taken really seriously so my parents enrolled me in in my cousin's dojo, the first dojo that I was enrolled in, and I was going there with other kids. Um, but I was there was there were not enough girls, maybe like three, four girls and fifty boys in every class. So yeah, I was just uh, I enjoyed. I was com- I was really good at it. I was good in my splits, my you know like my high kicks, my spins. My I was so disciplined. I was uh, focused. I just loved it. So, yeah, I just kept going every training and practicing um, every summer because my parents said, like, I have to study when I was at school. Um, And later on, after when I was 14, when I took my black belt, I just uh, went every single day, even during school time. I want to go back to the the fighting. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, fighting and, and, and mixing it up with kids your own age. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing. Oh yeah, but I don't. Uh, I haven't. Yeah. I can't say we've talked to too many people at five, at that age. You know, usually that when that starts happening, it's ten, eleven, twelve, maybe even older. But to be that young, yeah. I what, mean, what was going on? Um, five, and I would say five and six when I was started to go out in the street. We were living in this uh, poor neighborhood where kids are just uh, even like three, four years old in the street. <laughs> Um, and they just learn from their brothers and sisters uh, how to just, you know, fight in the street. Um, but I was that young and I was, uh, I started fighting first with my siblings and then I took it to the street and then I came back with so many bruises. Sometimes kids, you know, throw rocks at me and uh, it was like really aggressive fight. <laughs> uh, it was, um, it was just, you know, like when you're young, usually also uh, when you're a kid, boys sometimes are jealous that you're a girl and you're beating them up in like maybe football or, <laughs> and they just go crazy and they just punch you and attack you. Um, so I, I, I had to just, um, it, it was good that my parents enrolled me and my other, my siblings in Taekwondo because I, I learned how to fight at, at a very young age. Yeah, at least I wasn't being bruised as much. <laughs> so w- was your parents' desire to enroll you in Taekwondo because of the fighting? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, because okay. I, I think at that time, because my uh, all kids need to have some kind of activities. They can't just stay at home after school. So uh, they enrolled me and my siblings in, in Taekwondo because my cousin had his first uh, Taekwondo center in Jordan, Taekwondo Dojo. So we Makes were, sense. yeah, we were going there, the three of us. So then my brother and sister did not like it. So they uh, completely stopped practicing after a month. I was, I was more dedicated. I loved it. And when did you move? Uh, you mean move from? From, from Georgia. Oh. Yeah. Was that, was that as a child or did that happen? Uh, no, later. I mean, like okay. years ago, I was traveling. Oh, along, okay. Yeah. I was traveling okay. along. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll come back to that later. Yeah, I, w- I wasn't sure of the timeline. So let's, let's keep following this. So, you know, here you are, you're, you're, you're a young child and you're embracing Taekwondo and doing well with it. And, and you keep going. And, and more than a decade later, you, you train for earn your black belt. Yeah. And what's going on then? What's going on with you as a, you know, early teenager with your training? Um, 
I mean, I I did not like to go to school, honestly. I, I used to go to all girls' school, and uh, I just did not like the environment because at that time nobody was doing martial arts between you know among women, girls. And uh, they used to look at me and they say, "This smart, this sport is for boys. You need to stop doing it." And I was, uh, and you know how teenagers they can be really mean. Um, I did not find my community in school. I found it in taekwondo. So the moment I was, I, I just finished school at that time, like I go back home, I dress up and directly go to Taekwondo where I have my own environment and community and support and my master, um, everybody believed in me. So I just felt part of it and I felt I don't need to be someone else. Um, and I don't need to be, to prove to anybody that, or fake something that I'm not. Um, so I just used to, find it uh, the best um, escape from, um, you know, school, um, all this, you know, like bullying and uh, problems that I used to have in school. I just uh, could not wait to get to training because the training will get all my energy out. And then I cannot think about anything else. I just go back to sleep. Um, yeah, but I was, I was very dedicated to, to just at first to be in the national team when I got my black belt and everybody told me it's too early you just got your black belt you can't be in the national team and they said I can do it and they said no you're like 14 you just got your black belt you need a lot of years of training but then the first fight I got the silver medal and they were completely they did not expect it surprised um, I was fighting against um, gold agent gold medalist um, woman who won like uh, many many gold medals and um internationally and uh, they did not expect me to win that game but i i lost in one point and uh, they completely were shocked <laughs> because they did not expect a new you know like you just got your black belt <laughs> so i joined the national team at a very early age um at that time i mean just i just got the black belt joined the national team and then, yeah, I was addicted to fighting, uh, to competing. Uh, later on, I got my second Dan and then the third Dan. And I, I, I won about like 20 gold medals. Um, uh, yeah, national and international games. Let's go back because the, this idea of competition, yep. you know, and it's something that really resonates for some people, doesn't at all for others. But it sounds like this was something you were looking forward to yeah. for at least a little while. I can't, I, I can't imagine that you earn your first Don and then all of a sudden say, oh, this is something I think I want to try. It sounds yeah. like something that you've been thinking about for a while. Oh, yeah, a long time, long time. Since I joined, honestly, uh, I would say when I was like more aware, like seven years old, eight years old, it was it, just the Taekwondo dojo was, uh, the dojo was, uh, for me, home. So I, I cared about every word that my master would say, uh, my coach would say to me and other kids. I used to listen carefully. I wasn't forced to go there. You know what I mean? It was like my complete decision to, to be in the training. My, my siblings did not go. So it was their decision. But mine was like just to commit. And every time I even get a new belt, I would I would, I, I would imagine myself competing at the Olympics or I would dream big. So it was, yeah, it took, it was a journey of just believing and dreaming and practicing since I was a kid, um, all the way to competitions. And what, what did you find in competition? Everyone finds something different in competition and it's usually something about themselves. Yeah. What did you find about yourself? Um, at the beginning, I wanted to prove to everybody when I started competing that I'm, I can do it and I can be the person I need to be. And I thought that my dream is just to stick to Taekwondo and compete at the Olympics. And I just wanted to be in that path. But later on, after also a lot of, uh, I had a lot of struggles with the national team at that time because they have some kind of favorism they need like some kind of people to represent the country i was not one of them <laughs> because originally i come from 
Palestine. Uh, I'm not uh, completely Jordanian. So they had kind of racism problem where, where they don't talk about it, but they show it. They show it to you. Um, I was fired many times from the national team for no reasons. I, I was, uh, they, one time I won the gold medal in one of the competitions and they, they were planning that the, the girl that was competing with me, she needs to be the gold medalist. So they asked to do the game again, the competition again. And they said, no, I won in front of all the people. Everybody was there. Judges were there and it was a fair fight. I'm not going to repeat the fight. And they said, if you don't repeat it, we're going to just fire you from the national team. And I said, you know what? I'm quitting. And they said, oh, you made it easier for us. <laughs> we're going to pick her anyway. We're going to select her anyway. So it was unfair. Um, then later on, I, I realized I got a lot of injuries. I got, I got in, into, I was just, uh, they did not want me to be there, even though I was a gold medalist. But they had their own tribe and people that they want to, um, you know, invest in them, money and time and practice. And of course, there were a lot of money going to the Federation. So at that time, they wanted certain people to represent uh, the country. Um, that's why, by the way, Jordan was uh, way ahead. Like, they did not really progress a lot with women um, in the women national team because they always had this kind of favorism. And sometimes kind of, um, which is really sad, that kind of like the coaches uh, would need certain girls to fly with them to the to certain country just to be with that woman for, you know, uh, freely. So they can just, uh, you know, assault her, whatever, um, harass her. Or they had like many intentions that are not uh, toward the... Um, you know, uh, for the favor of the country, it's most. It was mostly for their own desires and intentions. So then I realized it was a very nasty environment. Um, I shouldn't be part of this community. And what am I trying? Who am I trying to prove my strength and my abilities? They don't want me anyway to be part of. They want um, to follow a certain. You know, it was all corrupted, honestly. I, I had to quit at some point. I had to just send an official letter and quit all the federation. How did that feel? Uh, it was hard because, you know, you've, yeah. been tra you've been, until I was 22 years old, it wasn't like, I started competing at the age of 14, but all the competitions took me, like I was nonstop competing until I was 22. At 22, I got injured in my knee anyway, and my knee stopped me from trying to keep going with the, you know, to prove myself to the Federation. Um, and they had a lot of corruption problems, um, like um, some uh, uh, coaches, they realized their certificates were kind of fake. Uh, they were not true or, yeah, they had a lot of, pro lot of problems that they had to deal with internally, other than the players. Um, and one time I had, uh, I had to test for my black belt. It was, it was a third Dan when I was 19 or 18, I can't remember. And um, before the test in one day, they brought me and, uh, and among all the players, the men and women, national team, and they said, Miss Khalifa, and they said yes. And they said, if I were you, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't uh, do the test tomorrow because you might fail. <laughs> and they, they told me I might fail before they even test me. So I said, what is this? Is he t giving me a warning uh, not to test because he wants to make, to make me fail? And um, that was um, uh, kind of the president of the whole federation. Um, I told my master at that time, they, he said that to me. And he said, you know what, I'll, I'll still go and test. I did go and listen to him, but he made me fail miserably in front of everybody. Even though I knocked, uh, I, I had to do the test with a guy and I knocked him down in like the first few minutes. Um, and they would still make everybody else pass while I failed. Then I had to, you know, like, uh, it was a really bad, bad struggle with the Federation. I had to, um, I had to uh, complain to the Olympic, National, uh, the Olympic Committee in Jordan and they contacted him and they said, you know, this is unfair. She needs to redo the test again. And 
you cannot favor kind of uh, some some players um but i and i did not trust him i said i'm gonna pay again for the test but what if he make me fail because he he has power to make me fail uh, in the test but they said no don't worry about it we we make sure that you are doing the test uh, properly and you actually pass so i read did the test again and uh, i got the second uh, out of uh, 40 people second place um, but imagine the first time you're like completely you fail <laughs> and then the second time you do it you get like second <laughs> which is it was all unfair so i had to stop you know i had to stop um, just going in this direction anyway how much of this attitude coming from these other people how much of it was because of your your heritage with as as at least partially Palestinian, yeah. how much of it was that you know I, I'm going to guess you weren't uh, you talked about some of the assault and unfortunately here in the U.S. we've we've had some of these issues with USA Taekwondo and yeah. and uh, I would imagine that just based on the little bit that we've heard from you today, you wouldn't have been uh, compliant is probably the best word yeah. Yeah. Uh, receptive yeah. and I would exactly. imagine that there were people who yes. weren't so fond of your independence. Yes, yes. So how, how you know, why, why, I guess, were you this target? Why were they so against you? Um, because they cannot, like, uh, the competitions in front of people, you cannot really fake it, right? Because there's like, uh, what, 200, 300 people are watching this competition. So they can't make you lose. Even if they try, they can't make you lose that game. They did make me lose one or two of the games. They were completely unfair, where I, I knocked the, my uh, competitor uh, down in, uh, in the first five, uh, uh, the second round. And they asked, they, they did not put any points for me. And they, they asked her to stand up. And uh, they were yelling at her, like, stand up, stand up. And I'm like, you should count. You shouldn't tell her, stand up. Um, but uh, because not just my heritage, um, I had a cousin who had the previous fights with the federations um, because they also did not want him to, um, you know, be a referee, like a global referee. Or so my family also suffered. At least one person in my family did have all these kind of problems, and there's like this old hate against my me and my family. Then I got introduced to Taekwondo and Federation, and I'm a new soul. Uh, I'm excited. I don't have, I have a dream to follow. I don't care about racism or heritage or which tribe I come from or which country I come from. But then all these things started to happen. And then I realized, you know, I have less power. I can't really do much. Um, but just to keep competing again and again and again and keep, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, but eventually at some point I, because I was fighting against the whole uh, system that was anyway, racist and corrupt. I injured my, uh, knee badly where I could not train or practice. I had to operate two times. How did that happen? What caused that injury? Uh, I think my frustration caused that injury. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, Honest. Yeah. My frustration from, uh, everything that is happening in my life that I thought I'm, I'm you know I can do it and I can I believe I, I have this big belief in myself um, but my first yeah my frustration came from the federation and the fights and constant fights with them you know trying to prove myself um, so one time I there was a, a taekwondo master who came from Korea who was so honest he had like um, Eight, eight or ninth dan degree and he wanted to train um, masters in taekwondo so you have to be three dan and above and i was three dan and i was one of the all the masters were getting the training in uh, under his uh, supervision and he he said that um uh, everybody needs to be on time you know there's like a lot of rules to the training nobody was showing all this ethics anyway they were late all the time uh, they they were out of shape and he was always pissed off like you know if you if you you know um he keep he kept telling them if you if you have um if you have if you believe in your country and you believe in 
in you know in uh, in the mission of uh, training taekwondo you have to commit to this practice and you have to show some discipline because you if you don't show it how can you show it to your students so anyway i was the only one showing up all the time and uh i was dedicated to the, to the training and he gave me the highest uh, mark on the test and they went completely crazy um i got i think 3 3.4 a uh, three point uh, no sorry I think it was uh, from five so I got like four point nine eight out of five and he said I want Lena to go he talked to the president of the federation he's like I want Lena to go uh, represent uh, Jordan in um, in the world uh, uh, Pumsi you know the Pumsi um, uh, games. And of course, they did not want to send me, right? <laughs> so that was the last time I had a big, big fight with the Federation because I was asked by one of the biggest masters in, in Korea to go, to go represent Jordan. And he, he came all the way to Jordan anyway to select the people he wants them to represent the country in the Pumsi uh, World uh, Championship. But then they said no again. And then I had enough. I... I was so angry and uh, I was doing my practice the second day. I twisted my knee and, uh, and that's where I injured my knee badly. I had to, I went to the hospital. It was, uh, the pain was crazy. Uh, I, the doctor said, you can't play any kind of sport right now because you're technically really badly injured. So the injury helped me a little bit to stay away from you know, all this uh, negative atmosphere where you're trying to prove yourself to a community that doesn't want to recognize you at all for your efforts. It's like exactly like when people now work in, um, in a corporate or in a, you know, trying to prove something to um, a company that doesn't see their worth. Uh, eventually, they're going to quit, right? right? Yeah, so that's right. what happened with me. And so what hap happened after? You know, did, it doesn't sound like you went back to competing for Jordan. No, I did not. <laughs> um, okay. After so what that, was next? Yeah, so after that, I was injured anyway. So I, um, I operated my, my knee twice on my knee, and it took two years to completely heal. So in these two years, I kind of took a break from, you know, everything that is going on in my life. And um, when I was, I was in college at that time, and uh, my friend was abused, and I said, you know, she can stand up for herself. Uh, she was assaulted. Um, uh, she was actually, yeah, by her, um, it was domestic, it was a domestic violence. So she was attacked by her brother and uh, father. And I said, women, why, why women are afraid to stand up for themselves and defend themselves? And I said, I need to teach them that martial arts and self-defense can help them build self-confidence. And that's how I started. I started teaching them self-defense training at the basement of my parents' house. Um, that's how I all like, I shifted completely from Taekwondo to creating my own system. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. So let's, let's talk about that. So the inspiration is something that I'm sure will resonate for other people. I, I think many of us, maybe even most of us in the martial arts want to help others. We want to protect people. That's something that's important to us. Yeah. Uh, but then yeah. to, to start teaching, that's something that not everyone does. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then to expand that into, you know, it sounds like to take some things from Taekwondo and likely, I'm, I'm guessing, oh, yeah, yeah. things from elsewhere and to develop your own curriculum, maybe even you call it your own style. Yeah. What was the story there? Uh, you know, Taekwondo as a martial art, it, it's so powerful. Uh, you know, like other martial arts, they are so powerful. It's just the people abusing those martial arts. Um, so I said, I'm, I'm definitely going to start helping women stand up against violence and injustice. And I'm going to help women, you know, learn how to defend themselves. Because when I, when I started asking them if they know even how to punch, they don't even know how to punch. <laughs> um, so imagine they never been in a fight. Of course, when they get assaulted, they're going to panic. Um, they're not going to try to defend themselves because this is something new to them. So I said, I'm going to just, you know, help them uh, build self-confidence because martial arts, Taekwondo has helped me become 
the person I am today. So I started at the basement. Um, it was when I was in college and uh, I, I didn't have, you know, big plans for it. I just wanted to help women at that time. And then later on, I started getting more and more, and more girls interested in the training. Um, in a few years uh, of training at the basement and sometimes booking, you know, events in spaces, in gyms and just going around the country providing events and seminars, I decided to uh, launch my uh, first self-defense studio for women, uh, She Fighter, in 2012. And what's gone on since then? I mean, that's eight years. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we can see the trajectory, right? It, it's, a lot of these, these points are lining up. Yeah. But how did it continue from there? You know, you, you've got the name and, and you're moving forward with it. And how, how was that received? Were, were people open to it? Um, it everything needs uh, any anywhere you go and you start creating some kind of uh, new, let's say, martial arts or sport or even new business. Everything takes time. Uh, a lot of people nowadays they want uh, fast results, but uh, everything needs time. Uh, so what I did is when I started, I had like small investment. I said I'm gonna start with a small small studio. Um, and I did. I launched uh, She Fighter in 2012, in June 2012. And I started getting like few people, few women interested in the training. Um, later on, I started getting more and more and more people uh, signing up. You know, they bring their friends. Their, uh, it's word of mouth mostly. It was very powerful. Um, and later on, like after two years of just working inside the business, I, the She Fighter system, I said, I can't keep, you know, giving the same training to everybody. It has to be like the martial arts. It has to be level system. Then I created my own uh, uh, level system, which is um, the pink is for beginners. The silver level is for the, uh, for the intermediate. Black is for the black level. And gold is for the professional level. And master is for the master level. And then I started certifying trainers, uh, teaching trainers and uh, certifying them. And then uh, those trainers would train students. So also the students go into the level system, but like it takes them more time than trainers. Right. Yeah, like, like any kind of uh, different martial arts. Sure. Like based sure. on a level system. I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that there's a part of this story that, that happened that you haven't mentioned. And, I, and I, I'm hopeful I'm wrong. But a lot of what you've talked about today is around people pushing back on you. Yeah. Like no, trying to hold you back. Yeah. And I'm going to be surprised if that didn't continue. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> so can you tell us about that a little? <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, you know, if you think about it, it's like when you grow up, you start to use your brain more <laughs> and your energy <laughs> less. Hopefully. <laughs> not everyone does, unfortunately. <laughs> I know. If you become like, you know, like uh, this high level of martial artist, you know, like guru, then you start using your completely like brain. Um, after a while, you realize it's not their dream. It's your dream. Of course, they're not going to believe in you. Of course, they're going to reject you. Of course, they're going to tell you. I mean, I'm just so blessed that I was rejected more than a thousand times <laughs> until now because it made me more, you know, believe more in what I'm doing and my, my message behind what I'm doing and who I am. I think if people just tell me that I was um, qualified since I was born, I was good at it when, you know, like I'm always like, I was never being beaten up because like I'm smart or I wouldn't have pushed myself to reach to this level that I reached all the way till now. And until now, a lot of people still, um, don't believe in many things I can do. Even though I did achieve a lot, they still don't see it. Um, some, it doesn't matter. It's not their dream. Anyway, it's your dream. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you, you know you're here for, on earth for a short period of time to do something and not to sit down and wait for everybody to approve uh, what you're here for. Nobody can tell you who you're here, what you're here for, what your mission on Earth, because you know you come to planet uh, Earth, <laughs> you come to life, and you live life uh, as a dream. So it's it's actually your dream. So you either create it, or you know it 
you will be part of another person's dream. So it's always like mm -hmm. uh, up to you at uh, eventually. Yeah. yeah. I like that. It's either your dream or you're part of someone else's. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. It's from martial arts, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah. And at some point you said a couple of years ago you moved. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I that that's not i mean I, I know what it's like to move across town and oh, i know yeah. how much work that is oh, and yeah. it's it's exhausting and expensive and exactly you didn't just move across town you moved across the world yeah why uh again because i was looking for my own community where they support women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um i've been like uh, now i have a team in jordan uh running sessions and classes of chief fighter and i I would definitely like, I completely rely on them. They're amazing. But, um, you know, I, I give the country more than enough, I guess, from, uh, and I would still inspire the people in the country by doing global things, not just uh, local. Um, so, to, so starting, my mission was starting local, going global um, mm -hmm. uh, by training trainers. So by helping others, also making some kind of uh, income uh, by providing this um, new style of and method of uh, self-defense and martial arts for women. So now we, we certified about 550 instructors globally. Um, wow. Yeah, but they're not all active because once you're um, trying to make a social change working with women, uh, you don't expect the same results as working with men. So men, um, for example, uh, they just do things, uh, they take more risks. Not all of them, but I mean, uh, they're just, you know, raised this way. But women, you need uh, to build leaders, not coaches. So you need to uh, talk to them, coach them, show them how to take it step by step, um, have calls with them every once in a while, just encourage them to keep doing um, what, what they're doing. So it's just building... I wouldn't say, I, I don't call them really instructors, I call them leaders because eventually they're leading also another change in their own communities and they need the support and help um, coming from me or other women. Um, so, so I said, um, since, since I'm also Canadian, I'm also a Canadian Jordanian, I'm gonna you know, um, move to Canada and expand my system in Canada and North America. Yeah, like training trainers and certify them. And what's the response been? Um, I still did not start yet. <laughs> I mean, okay. I was traveling a lot and I was, you know, sure. like working on, you know, like uh, everything else, like legal, you know, like we're just yeah. doing your business, taking your, it, yeah. It, like it, it's it takes, a big deal. Oh yeah, but it takes a lot a of time, deal. you know that. Uh, Absolutely. Like moving, um, just uh, at this moment, I built my connections in, in Toronto and um, some cities in America. Uh, now the next step is start organizing events and uh, seminars and then training of trainers. Well, I know that there are certainly a lot of people open and positive with this movement, this I the idea of, I mean, the word that's coming to mind is empowering. Oh, yeah, I, I'm sure. Women from a, a martial arts and non-martial arts perspective. And I love that you're using that word leader because I think it is so important. And it's a word that we don't use often in the martial arts world. I oh, mean, yeah. I see it used in children's programs, the idea of we're teaching leadership, but you said it in a way that really clicked for me that, you know, a leader can have so much more of an impact yes, yeah. than simply teaching a class. Yeah, because exactly, like even instructors, they're kind of leaders, if you think about it. They're changing people's lives every day, um, especially if they're passionate about teaching. Um, but why I call them leaders is because they're going to start everything from scratch. And starting everything from scratch is not easy, um, you know, a, a task to do. I started everything from scratch. And you feel a lot of, you feel like left out sometimes. You're alone, you need to talk to someone, you're rejected a lot, uh, you need a mentor. And uh, now that's what I'm also doing. After training those women, I don't leave them alone. Um, we stay in touch, we have groups, uh, we talk, we do meetings, uh, we, we just talk about obstacles. And so 
just step by step forming um, leaders community uh, of all these leaders <laughs> taking uh, taking action in their own communities and societies. Do you have a mentor? Uh, I used. I used to have when I started a many men like one one amazing mentor and then another mentor. I'm actually blessed to have like my Taekwondo master was a mentor for me for so long. He believed in me like nobody ever believed in me. He he even told me like one time, he said, you know, like you see all this federation, the men teaching, you know, women trying to just, you know, use them for their sexual appearances or whatever. He said, like, I don't even like those women. You know, like, you're a badass. I like your personality. And he always believed in me. Um, he said, like, you know, you're just amazing the way you are. You don't have to change for other people or to please other people. So when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, it was my Taekwondo master. And then when I quit the Taekwondo, uh, I had another mentor that is uh, British, and he he kept calling me every like once in a week, just giving me encouragement about what I'm doing, what I'm starting. And uh, later on, it was like um, even uh, you know people that I meet, uh, uh, whether they're like uh, CEOs or you know women taking also the lead in their own communities, uh, countries, cities, and they they started uh, calling me and supporting me. And they always say, I'm here for you. You know, you don't even have to pay for it. Or... So it's always good to have some kind of support where you have the same language, you're heading the same direction, and they understand your suffering <laughs> um, in this life. And they have been in your shoe. Um, so it's always good to, I call them like being among your tribe. Because a tribe is a very powerful um, word that connect a certain group of people together. And the tribe is, um, you know, like there's like uh, the indigenous tribe, there's like even in Jordan, the Bedouin tribe, there's like different, different tribes. And those people, nobody can get between this tribe uh, because they're just so loyal uh, to each other and they, they share the same values and beliefs. Um, so I looked around, like, where is mostly women are rising now? It's mostly in America, honestly. Like, if you look around, um, even in Europe, even in Africa, it's still, like, still women are trying hard uh, to make it. But women in North America, they're having voices. <laughs> there's now, like, I've heard um, there's, like, a coach, uh, a woman coach in the um, uh, football league in uh, in the United States, like she's a female coach uh, to to a men uh, men so, um, football uh, American football. Um, right. Yeah, like uh, you you kind of see all this you know uh, development in happening in North America, where women are using more their leadership, their voices, their. So yeah, that's why I said it's a good way to expand the movement. <laughs> good location, good, uh, and uh, I do get a lot of support also from women in business in Toronto and uh, in uh, in America as well. It almost sounds like looking back, this is the only way your life could have gone. I mean that that sounds almost uh, trite for me to say. Yeah, but if we look back, I mean everything still seems to line up for this, for where you are, for what you've been doing the last few years. Do you, do you feel that way? Oh yes, um, you know, life is is very very interesting. Sometimes we think we understand it, but then you reach a certain age where you have to kind of start all over again, or try something else, or it take you on a different direction, and you freak out. You say, "Oh no, you know, I've been in this path for ten years, uh, and now you want me to take another direction." And then you start fighting with life. But I think, I think. From my experience, the more you fight to, with life, the more you say, you know, it's not your rules, it's my rules, you're going to get yourself into uh, early, um, I would say, death or sickness or injuries. The way I did not listen to life whispering to me, telling me this is not my community when I was in, in the Federation in Taekwondo, it was telling me, leave, leave, leave. <laughs> 
all the signs were like leave um you know it's like the doors are all closing in front of your face and you just still want to push that door wide open and go in but it's locked you know what i mean and there's another door that is wide open you don't see it and then you you're limited you're like your brain is limited all you see is that that door while there's a door behind your back it's wide open for you and life is telling you directing you to just look to the other direction but you refuse to listen then life will start you know giving you warnings you get sick you get i mean this is in all everything like even in your working like you to go to work or when you know you know like you don't fit there it's not your energy why are you there just quit but you keep saying giving excuses you know like no i have kids i have i can't you know i can't do this i i can't i can't just quit and you don't listen to life it's like you know you're you're taking yourself all the way to you know mostly misery or um options that life can giving can give you with like a lot of uh you know life has a lot of um good things good things in it it's just to die you have sometimes to go through the dark side of course in order for you to see the light you have to go through the tunnel and in the tunnel you're going to learn how to be a fighter and you're going to learn how to overcome these challenges but when you see the light it's just because you choose to see the light and you choose to listen to to life and uh, at this at this moment uh, in my life i'm 35 years old now and when i started everything with she fighter and i was like maybe 22 or so it's like long time ago or 24 um when i had the idea and developed the idea it took too much time but i always try different things so when at this moment for example i say if i try this because sometimes it's not clear what you know direction you should take but then try different directions and there's no such thing called you wasted your time everybody has their own time and everybody has their own clock so when time is up you're dead <laughs> um technically so you can say i'm running out of time you can say i wasted my time for example just wandering around doing nothing or i you you can't use these words because everybody on this earth has a different time and dimension so when you start believing in that you know that you know even if you take it slow um it will lead you uh to what you have to do eventually even if you think you're not doing much uh, the way that other people are doing a lot and they hustle and they push uh you think you're missing out but it's no it's not your time to shine yet so i learned all of that from my experiences and decisions and just uh, trying to understand the universe wow <laughs> yeah we took I don't know we took it to from respond. martial I mean, arts too <laughs> yes. yeah yeah, and I love when we do that. I love when it when it wanders around, but it's really not that far off. I, I think this is just such an important layer to martial arts that not everyone gets to experience and not everyone thinks about. Yeah. So I'm glad glad that you're talking about it. You just have now to let's, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, you just have to think sometimes too much. Some a lot of people avoid thinking. Um, that's why they do they stay busy, right? All the time. But I think we have a brain to use it, uh, <laughs> or else we wouldn't have a brain. Um, but uh, I think if you just spend more time with yourself, thinking and uh, researching and taking different path, uh, trying meeting new people, um, cultures, and you know, do just new things you you never done, you'll experience life as it is. I agree. Put down the phone. <laughs> After the episode's over, <laughs> yeah. let's look, let's look at the future. Yeah. You know, you've accomplished some amazing things, and I can't imagine that you're done looking to accomplish things. I'm sure you have goals. Yeah, you talked about some of the goals for She Fighter in growing and spreading that. But what? Talk about what those goals look like, and talk about some of the other goals, maybe some personal goals that you might have. Yeah. So goals for Sheep Fighter, um, I'm looking to um, train 
I wouldn't give like a number by certain years, but train as many trainers as I can to expand uh, this movement. Because um, honestly, it's not about me anymore. It's about others. So I have this kind of knowledge. It's my duty on this earth to give it to others. Um, so by training trainers and, you know, and uh, those leaders will take it, trainers and leaders will take it to their communities That's um, and start forming their own schools, like she fighter schools. Um, so, you know, having thousands of uh, she fighter schools all over the world um, with a new philosophy of training and new belief and uh, uh, building new, and believe also in kids and boys and, uh, and girls and families you know, just uh, spreading love and positive vibes. Um, so that's my, um, my, my goal for Shi Fighter is also to be recognized as an Olympic sport one day. So they would definitely, like we would definitely have uh, global competitions and it will lead um, to Olympic competitions where all these competitors, you know, will, will find a goal uh, to, to train for or to be at the Olympics. Yeah, so that's like my professional, uh, my professional goals. Great. Personal goal, keep growing um, from within, from uh, inside, outside, and uh, through my uh, using also my brain frequencies and brain waves. So if, um, if I keep growing um, in my brain and my soul and my spirit, um, that's for me like the ultimate success in life. Because <laughs> um, imagine if you have all this money in the world, but you're still dumb. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do you really... I, I think we've all thought that, but I don't think anyone's been brave enough to say it that way. I love it. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, do you really want to be in their shoes? Like, do you, like if you if you write down, let's say, I do that exercise like uh, a lot every day. So I write down. Five things that I have money can't buy, like health, uh, mind, uh, even like no stupidity, whatever. <laughs> um, you write down five things yeah, that you already have money can't buy. And write down five things you want to have uh, that money can buy. And then um, try to replace one with the other one. Uh, like, would you replace health with wealth? What do you choose? And the answer would be always health. Do you, do you replace youth with wealth and being old, for example? Or you still choose youth? For example, I still choose youth. Uh, do you choose, um, you know, uh, having this spiritual connection with your money, uh, mind and body? Or you want to be 75 years old, you don't even understand anything about life. Which one you choose? So it's all choices. Um, you know, we have a lot of choices to make. But when you write them down, you realize you already have everything. You have health. You, you have family. You have people you love around you. You have cats, maybe pets. Uh, you have, you know, you can just go outside, breathe. Um, you have everything. You don't need the other things that you don't have to make you complete. You already have everything and you have everything inside of you. So I still choose to look at this list where I have my health, my, my mind, my, my philosophy, my even impact for all these women. I still choose my youth. I'm young, you know? So a lot of people would say, oh, if I was young again, I, could, I would climb the mountain. <laughs> but they're old, right? Um, so it's all choices. Um, but uh, people want to miss out on life and they want to work a lot, overwork and work and work and work. And suddenly they're like 70 years old. Can they, you know, do all the things that they used to do? Or no, they're probably going to just go around the world, you know, travel with this money, eat in restaurants, and they're always tired and they want to go to sleep. So it's, it's all options. Um, and I choose all the time to be satisfied in what I have completely now. Now, if people want to find you and She Fighter and everything that you're doing online, where would they go? Uh, SheFighter.com, my website. Um, they're on all social media at She Fighter. So just She Fighter. 
Easy. Yeah, easy. Nice and easy. Easy. One more thing as we head out here. Yeah. What final words would you give to anyone listening today? You know, what what advice, what last words, whatever you want to call it? Um, advices. I, I would say um, one of the advices, like learn something new you never tried. Like uh, learn a new language, uh, learn martial arts, <laughs> learn something you, even if you think it's, you're old or too late, it's, it's never too late. It's just try something new because it will help you expand your brain. Um, so that's my advice. And for parents, um, I always say that advice, like you have to enroll your kids in a martial arts a school um, and they, it make, make, make it their choice. If they love it, let them continue. If they don't love it, like let them try other martial arts because you, we, we as humans, we have the instinct of fighting in, in us and we need to use it, uh, especially boys. Um, they, they need to use it. Either they use it for violence or they use it in a proper way that uh, they learn how to discipline those uh, techniques. So it's always better to enroll them in martial arts. For me, this was a pretty powerful story. I have always identified as a bit of a rebel, as someone who likes to take the lemons that the world throws and turn them into something else. And I see a lot of that in Coach Khalifa. It doesn't surprise me that she's been so successful in spreading this message and in promoting what she's done in her home country. And I have no doubt that once her feet are under her in Toronto, that she's going to be making an impact. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your story. And I look forward to updates. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got a lot more there. You can find videos and links, photos, every other episode we've ever done. Tons of stuff. We never put any of that behind a paywall. And if you're willing to support us and the work that we're doing, you have a number of options. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off at whistlekick.com. You can also share this or any episode. Maybe leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. We'd love to hear your guest suggestions or just general feedback for the show. So you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and our social media accounts are at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.